And with no further ado, I'll go ahead and let you know who the folks are who will be uh, our panelists today on this call. And you won't be able to see him because he's calling in is Mr. Harold Long. Uh, his is Long Family Farms in Murphy, North Carolina. Um, he's a Cherokee Indian. His is a Cherokee Indian family farm. And he was named North Carolina's Small Farmer of the Year in 2019. So we're really excited to have him and his wife, Nancy, um, who will be, um, you'll hear her voice on this call today, although her um, utterances will be those of Harold. Mr. Long has had um, some health challenges around his throat. And so she'll be um, transferring his words to us today. Uh, also on the call is Mr. Bernard Obi with um, Abenitu Organics. Did I pronounce that correctly? Abenitu Organics in Person County. Um, what will I say about your, I feel like if I say more about your farm, it'll get so into your story. So I'll, I guess I'll just say that and, and let you tell your fuller story as we go. Also, Ms. Monisha Renee Brooks with Grow Green Acres in Nakina. Is it Nakina or Nakina? I'm still new to North Carolina, so I'm still getting the names right. Nakina. Nakina, okay, North Carolina. She's a fifth generation farmer, so it'll be really, really great to hear about your experience today. Um, Miss Helen Fields uh, and her husband Joseph own and operate Joseph Fields Farm at Johns Island um, near Charleston, South Carolina. Um, they are a third generation Gullah Geechee farm family. Um, and uh, the fourth farmer is Mr. Michael Carter Jr. Um, of Carter Farms in Unionville, Virginia. And if I'm not mistaken, yours is a century farm. Um, and also on this call is Ms. Mavis Gregg Esquire. She's the director of the Sustainable Forestry and African American Land Retention Program. And uh, she'll be Answer. She's done a lot of work with heirs, property, and estate planning work prior to her role. So um, we're really excited that she's on this call today. And with no further ado, I will turn the floor over to Mr. Bryant to begin this conversation today. Yeah, I really want to take time to um, thank everyone um, for being here. Also, um, honor many of us in our legacies have we been able to make it this far to have this conversation. Um, and I want to spend a little bit of time um, just thinking about, well, number one, we, we also need to, and I don't know if we did this already, but we want to thank Kellogg for being able to, to fund this um, for us. Um, we would not have been able to do this without them. Um, so, so all of the panelists, I'm going to open up with a question. And I want us to just take a small amount of time to, to address it as best we can. Um, and we kind of had a pre-conversation just to talk about us a little bit. But we wanted to know, how are you preserving the history, culture, and traditions around your land as you farm it? And we can start with, um, with Harold Long first, and then we'll, we'll move to Baba Obi and Monisha, Michael, and then to Ms. Fields. Mrs. Fields, sorry. Hello, um, this is Nancy Long, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I'll be speaking for Harold, and uh, one of the way that he's uh, preserving the history is uh, the land that he's actually farming is in two different uh, parcels. One is um, a deeded parcel, which at one time was Cherokee land that was taken away from the Cherokee during the Trail of Tears. And so now that particular uh, parcel is back in a Cherokee Indian family farm. And the other uh, portion of the farm is actual tribal land, which uh, adjoins the um, the farm and uh, the culture and the uh, traditions. He's raising crops that are important to the Cherokee and the Appalachian cultures. 
Thank you for that. Bob Obi. You're on mute. You still muted. Right there now. Okay. All right. So I just thank peace, everybody. Glad to be here. Good to see everyone. Uh, well, we're farming the same ground that our, you know, great great grandmother began, in the, at least uh, a part of it uh, so long ago. Our uh, there's a, a portion of our families buried on the property. Uh, the old buildings that we used uh, back in the day, we've taken a fair amount of effort to maintain and you know to preserve those. Uh, we're growing a lot of the same crops and using uh, some of the same methods that we did uh, at least when we were kids and came along. So uh, there's a lot that connects us with you know our history and our ancestors and our past and uh, what we're doing today with the ground. Monisha. Okay. okay, my name is Monisha Brooks and I am a fifth generation farmer in the kind of North Carolina. We're down in the southeast corner, a little part of the key that dips down in South Carolina. That's pretty much where we're located. And um, what I've started doing to preserve the, um, I guess, the farm legacy that our great grandparents would have started is I've started basically farming and uh, well, produce crops. We used to be tobacco farmers. And once they asked us to stop farming tobacco back in like the late 80s, early 90s, um, our farm kind of sat dormant or uh, it didn't produce anything for the family, as in they cash rented it. And that was how they were preserving it. It was an unspoken don't sell it amongst the generations, just cash rent it out, you know, that kind of thing. And we are now in the process of farming that land. Um, my own portion is about 15 acres of it, you know, an original 200 some acres. And we are now uh, doing produce that you would find in your grandmother's garden to try and introduce that to the next generation so that they see how important it is to have good food and healthy food and something that you can raise. And that includes livestock, like we're doing chickens and the kids are able to come down for the summers and, you know, put their hands in the soil and help raise animals and it, it gives them like a sense of, um, I don't know, it, I, I can't exactly explain it, but that's how we're preserving ours. And then we're looking forward to um, not only introducing them to farming, but then also um, elevating our, our farming so that these kids will do something, you know, into the next generation. They realize that it, you've got to eat well and you have to treat the land well that kind of thing. So this is something that I'm looking forward to doing as we're starting up our farm again, um, just not for commodity crops, we're doing it for the everyday person to eat well. Ms. Carter? Yes, sir. Um, we're doing pretty much the same thing and thanks to Rossi for providing a grant for us to actually do this. Uh, we're telling a story in doing Afrotourism, highlighting the various contributions that Africans and African Americans have contributed to agriculture along the farm. Um, and in that, we create signage where we highlight, let's say, the corn planter that was invented by Henry Blair. Uh, we highlight the peanuts and the groundnuts and tell the history of the plant. Uh, in addition to that, we talk about the family history. Uh, I spent a lot of time at the courthouse kind of finding out who, what, when, and where. Um, so we tell the story of my great uncle Alfonso, who was a World War II vet who died on a tractor on a farm in 1968. Um, to really help, not just in telling the story, because it's a story I didn't know for 40 years uh, that wasn't shared with me, but also to help our people kind of work through that land trauma that many of us experience as we grow up on the land and the farm uh, that extends down to generations. Because he died two days before Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated many of the, my elders on the farm left the farm and we didn't go past that point where his tractor tipped over and killed him. And so we didn't see, um, we didn't see the stream on the back of the uh, lane. So we were trying to tell it uh, very emotionally, 
differently with signage, with QR codes on the sign, so you can do it technologically as well, as well techn technologically as well. Um, and then I'm working with my son as well to write a story, children's story about the land and the farm, um, because that's a history and a story, something we all possess. And if we do it well, we'll be able to preserve it for generations to come. Thank you for that, man. That's powerful. Ms. Fields, Mrs. Fields, um, you guys are on, <laughs> you're on Gullah land. So tell us a little bit about that and, and how that impacts your, how you guys are preserving that. All righty. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Helen, and I'm the wife of Joseph Fields. Joseph is the third generation farmer. He started out many, many years ago. Um, he was a little boy and his parents instilled in him exactly what he needed to do. Today, what we're doing to preserve the land and the culture, we're doing tours. Um, we have three or four different schools that come over. We have something that's called the Strawberry Shed. The Strawberry Shed is my, um, I've reached forth, and I know that someday that Strawberry Shed is going to be a mo museum. So what we have done, we've already putting stuff in there for the museum. The children are very, very excited when they come. When they come and the buses put them off, they either go in the field and they pick vegetables. The vegetables that they pick, they're allowed to cook, and they even prepare lunches. They even help to harvest stuff to do for the CSA boxes, because we do CSA boxes. We also do farmer's markets. We sell basically wholesale and retail. Uh, my husband's determination is that he can train somebody's child to take over and to become the next generation farmer. That's our goal. That's, that is super powerful. Thank you for that. Um, so this next question, I'm going to preserve it just for a couple of people. Um, this next question is, how did you gather your family together to discuss stewardship of the land? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask um, Michael to go first, then Baba Obi, and then I want to hear um, from, from Harold about this one specifically. And then maybe if you want to come in on the end part of this, um, just to give us some pointers for people who might be thinking through this, that'll be super important too. Uh, Thanks, Jory. Um, I said mine starts uh, maybe about five, three or four years ago, five years ago. I was living in West Africa. Um, I had taken advice of the Ku Klux Klan who said that if uh, you don't like America, you need to leave. I left with no intention of ever coming back. Um, and the land kind of brought me back to coming back to America. And when I came back, uh, my family had a gather gathering to welcome me back. Uh, and from then, I started asking questions about the history and about putting it in the land trust uh, and saying that I wanted to do something with it, which urged the rest of the family to at least take notice uh, of it. We have 150, 185 acres in uh, central Virginia uh, that's been in our family since 1910. Uh, and actually, two parcels, one since 1910, the other since 1915. Um, so we have two century farms, literally, uh, that stayed in the family land. Uh, and once I started to do more research on it, and build out a farm plan or what I wanted to do and build out the farm history. It really galvanized the older family. I went to them, a lot of the uh, elders, my great uncles and great aunts and asked some stories about the land. Uh, they gave me very vivid details about when they acquired it, how they acquired it, how we almost lost it during the uh, depression, how my grandfather and his brother sent back their uh, World War II pay of $22 a month to reacquire the land, to buy back the land from the bank because it's up for sale. Um, and this also inspired me another kind of way because my, I only knew my grandfather is an alcoholic, somebody who drank a lot and didn't understand his true story of dedication and focus and resilience and probably pain and self-medicating. Um, and it became incumbent upon me now to make sure I told that story in a proper way, in a way that really lifted, lifted up his legacy uh, his sacrifices, his experiences, and, and gave him a lot of more honor than what I had before I left for Ghana. Um, so through that process, I've learned a lot about other members of the family uh, and a lot of various his history about that family. And the family's been appreciative, especially the younger generation, my generation and the generation under me, uh, where they now can be proud of social media posts and Instagram posts 
and being proud, that's my family. That's my land. That's something I possess. Uh, so we utilize, I think, a little bit of, a lot of little tidbits to get our family together and to say that we were unequivocally not going to sell our land. Bob Obi? Yes. Um, so um, we all, I have seven, I have, um, there's seven of us. Uh, Seven of us that uh, that lived, and uh, everybody grew up on the farm. We all went to college, and you know pursued you know quote successful careers, doing other stuff. And then uh, you know my father was killed actually at a tragic uh, event here. It really wasn't an accident. It was uh, deemed to be uh, you know, second degree murder. Um, uh, and the event wound up shattering our family, the ties and, you know, all the things that hold people together. And, uh, since he was the farmer, he, uh, you know, after he passed, everybody just kind of pursued, you know, their own thing. Everybody had young kids and, obligations and so on. I was living away, actually uh, half a country away and so on. Uh, but that was the beginning. Um, you know, we, um, you know, I decided to come back and uh, kind of pick things up and uh, nobody really was that interested. And there was a lot of uh, tension and enmity in the family and so, it did take, uh, it took quite a bit of time to just reestablish, uh, you know, a working type of relationship. I could go into that, but I'll, I'll just suffice it to say that, uh, you know, it was important for someone who had good relations with everybody to sort of lead that effort and who, you know, has sort of an altruistic idea of um, you know what needed to happen to save the farm and to uh, bring more importantly bring bring the family back together in the end after uh, uh, after about ten years of uh, you know working saving the land keeping it from growing up and returning to forests and all of that uh, you know we uh, began to um uh, you know work and talk we hired an attorney to set up an llc uh, we had done uh taken time to do research and we decided that we wanted to go that way as opposed to a trust and i could go into it but uh we that was a thing that fit us in our situation best it took once we got the operating agreement and all of that it took four years for folks to look at and read, ask questions, uh, to implement refinements and changes. It took years to go through that process, reestablish uh, trust and, you know, a willingness for people to, you know, sort of embrace each other again. And um, anyway, long story short, we did get that piece done. And uh, I can say that not only that we you know, save the farm and keep it from being sold. And, you know, people sort of wanting their individual shares. Some of it was, uh, you know, air property and uh, some of it was not. But, um, you know, in the end, we were able to work that out. And we did, um, you know, we, we're closer today than, than uh, as a family than we ever were. So that was our number one goal. And number two was we were able to you know, save the farm and everybody has a voice, not an active hand in, you know, the work that goes on with the farm. The last thing I would like to mention is uh, the, uh, you know, a uh, third of the farm was taken when they, when the, uh, you know, folks came in through eminent domain and put in a lake hydroelectric power plant uh, the best part of the farm, it turned out, uh, you know, the most fertile 
part, uh, you know, but you know, we're not, we're not really focusing on that. We're focusing on being good stewards of what we have left and, uh, you know, sort of bringing a family together, making sure the young people who follow us have a good example to, uh, you know, to, to be able to look to and to follow. I'm very happy to report as the last thing that, you know, we've just agreed as a family on a, a system of values uh, that, you know, we've pledged to live by as a family, not just in the way that we relate to each other and to our neighbors and community, but to uh, business partners as well. So we've come a long way, it's been a long walk, uh, and it's been a lot of work, but it has been worth it. Thank you for sharing that. That was, um, there was a lot in that statement. Um, Nancy, I would love to hear about how this look for you guys as an indigenous community. Um, maybe similar stories may be different, but we would really like to hear um, how, how did this come to be for you guys? Well, um, fortunately, our, our family is um, all on the same page as far as the beliefs and, and values of what what they want to do with the farm. And um, earlier I had said that, you know, part of the farm is actual tribal land. And um, unfortunately, it had become like a dumping ground and Harold kept cleaning it up and cleaning it up. And then he petitioned the tribe to let him purchase that which was adjoining the deeded parcel. And he had looked for 10 years um, to try to uh, find a farm. And when he looked at the soil, he just touched it and he knew that it was very good soil and it did end up being um, prime soil. So as far as the stewardship of the land, um, we're first sa you know, saving the prime soil by using only organic practices. And then we uh, grow and save heirloom seeds and we only grow heirloom seeds. So um, we're, we're trying to uh, save the heirloom seeds that are important to the Cherokee and the mountain communities here. Then we're also um, raising heritage livestock to try to save the different livestock. And I think with all of the, um, you know, from the soil to the seeds to the livestock, I think that, um, you know, we're, we're not just saving the farm, but uh, we're basically saving ourselves as a family and uh, saving the farm. Um, wow, that is, that was very powerful. Um, does Manisha, Helen, um, you know, I know that you guys had different experiences. Helen, how how did you gather your, your, you guys together? How did you guys come together around stewarding okay. that land? What we did to preserve the land. First of all, Joseph's mom and dad instilled in them since they were children how to love each other, how to work together. One is to look out for the other. Now, after the death of his mom and then his dad, they read the will and the person, the oldest brother that was left in charge was a very responsible and trustworthy person. They had a family meeting. There is about, uh, they had land from the 1800s that his great-grandfather bought the child here on his back from slavery and they kept that land. That land is very precious. In the 19, early 1960s, they bought 55 acres across the street. The parents never want their children to separate. On this 55 acres, each child has a house spot which consists of over one acre. That is in each person's name. The rest of the land is in an estate. 
The reason for that, so that the family would stay together, they make decisions together. Today, Joseph Fields Farm is ran by Joseph, but he, each brother and sister, they're now 80, 79, 76. They're all, everybody is active doing something. Everybody goes to work every day, and they got something to do. They um, reason together. They learn to love each other. Sure, there are misunderstandings, but you come, come around and you talk about it, and you make your decisions together because the main thing is the land is to be passed on from one generation to the other, and you never want anybody else to, get, to have any part of it. Now, they may lease you a little piece of it, but it, it will always be in the Fields family. Thank you for that. Manisha? Okay, so my family, um, they only allowed me to have the first 15 acres to try this on. And uh, <laughs> it's okay because it's, it's been a learning process, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, my two uncles, the last two standing, so to speak, are sitting there with, you know, their hands folded wanting to see, you know, what we're going to do with it. Now, one of my uncles is very, very involved. He's every day with me. He's out, like, getting blades fixed on something right now for me. So he nor my first cousin, Chris, are here right now with me in the seminar. Um, but what we've done is we've gone on this, un, you know, this verbal agreement over the generations, don't sell the land. And now as I listen to Mrs. Fields and Michael Carter and uh, Mr. Obi and them talking about their land trust and their family values and things like that, that's something that I will have to bring back to the rest of my family now because we're younger at it than anyone on the panel is. Um, Michael looks younger than us, but like he has like a century farm that he's dealing with, you know, and uh, so for me, the stuff that I'm learning, even though I'm a panelist today, is what I'm going to try and implement with everyone that's in my generation. So like my first cousin, Chris, and I, who are in the trenches right now trying to reawaken this, you know, this farm that has been sitting dormant for a while that has been here, you know, for 100 years in our family, we are now faced with... Um, getting everyone from our generation on board. And the, when I say the last two uncles standing from their generation, because the generation before all of them have now passed, but we want to honor that legacy of keeping the family land in the family. And there's a, you know, many stories like a lot of African Americans where um, after slavery, they were sharecroppers. Well, this white man gave his mixed children <laughs> their land, their portion. This is the land that we are now farming and it is also the land that we're trying to keep from there are other, there's another side of this family that is constantly trying to get it back. Why, we don't know. But like there's a last one standing on that side that is a stronghold also. So we're, 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 we are seeing something in the future that would, would be able to join everybody together. And that's, that's what I'm hoping to do by listening to the other panelists as well today. Yes. To preserve well, that land. Yeah, I wanted you to share that because I know that a lot of people on the call or might be here for that very reason to think about it and be in the same position that you're in. Um, and so like we're going to transition into another kind of section and I'm going to actually pose this question to Mavis. Um, you know, because a lot of people are trying to figure out, well, how do I go about doing this? And or what if land is just sitting out there? Um, the question is, what if any process, considerations, or documents do you or should you have in place to ensure smooth transfer of the land? Um, and to keep it simple, it's just like, what do we need to know? What do, what do we need, maybe? Tell us what we need. Um, thank you for the question. Um, am I allowed to share my screen? Okay. Yes, yes, you are. <clears throat> uh, maybe I don't know how. Oh, it's a little self-indulgent, actually. Um, I started my law practice in 2015, and I think this was taken around 2016 with Mr. Obi. Um, so very new in my law practice, which was centered around intergenerational wealth um, through family-owned land for 
primarily for the black community. I own Ayers property. Um, I'm from the western part of the state. Um, so it's great to hear Murphy County's um, here. But um, this work is very personal to me because we lost most of my family's wealth because we didn't have a plan in place. Um, we still have two properties on which my family um, survived, you know, grew its own food and everything. And they were purchased by um, women who were domestic workers in the 30s um, in the mountains. So it was very personal to me. Um, but my, plan, my parents didn't have a plan. No one in my family had a plan. So between 1930 and 2012, we accumulated land, but then we lost it all in pretty much a day, um, almost all of it. So that's why I do this work. Um, and I think the first step in making a plan, so to speak, is to understand that you can either have, we all have a plan. Um, you can have the government plan, which is what kicks in if you don't have your own customized plan, or you can have a customized plan where you work with an attorney, where you sit down and think about what the objectives are of your property, um, discover what the characteristics of your property are, you know, what are the, and I'm pretty sure most of you on this call, if not all of you already know the characteristic, characteristics of your property, but understand what your property is capable of can really help influence the choices you make when it comes to addressing the legal structure um, and succession planning of the family property. So um, the next thing you wanna think about once you understand what your property is and what your goals are is who all plays into this, who, who is going to be impacted by any kind of planning you um, are going to do. And in the case of heirs property, it may be people that you don't get along with or people who have very different interests and values. And so I think it's also important to understand what those relationships are and who will necessarily need to be involved and what your threshold or what your tolerance is, both from a financial perspective, but from an emotional perspective as well. Um, because you could have a goal and you could have a, a plan to reach that goal, but then you might get derailed or it might have to pivot. And it's important to know what you're capable of doing both emotionally and financially so that you can um, optimize for success. Um, and so then thinking more legally <laughs> in terms of the legal documents, um, there are different ways to plan for succession of your family land. Um, we've already talked about limited liability companies and trusts, um, and I'm happy to show you diagrams of what those two types of entities look like, if that's helpful. Um, but it really does depend on how the land is being used and who's involved and what your goals are. So a limited liability company um, in addition to allowing you to create a succession plan, you also have to report to the state government. You have to have annual meetings, you have to file annual reports. Um, if you have more than, um, I think it's 25 owners of the LLC, then we get into securitization issues, um, which is a whole other topic that you might not think about when you're thinking about um, owning your land with your family, you think about securities. Um, so a tr an LLC may not be for everyone, but it also could be a very good option for your family because of the, the flexibility that you have with planning and so forth. And then a trust is a different type of entity that you can use, but it has, serves the same function. It's meant to um, own the property generation to generation. Um, and the trust doesn't require that you report to the state or to any authority. Um, the trust can make requirements of reporting internally, but it doesn't have, you don't have to have that kind of public interaction. Um, but trust also have complexities that I think it's important that you understand before you choose to do a trust. Um, and then I also think there's a uh, in between doing nothing or maintaining the current situation and reaching your objective. And I think it's, under, I think it's very important to consider what's um, in between that you could at least improve the situation or at least improve the um, opportunity to avoid risks of loss.
Thank you for that. We're going to come back to you at a, at a later time to ask questions that people in the, in the, the chat might have for you specifically. Um, but I want to kind of shift it back to our farmers um, and ask this question to everyone. And um, yeah, so what are some of the challenges slash barriers that farmers and landowners may encounter around estate planning? Like what were the things that kind of, you know, just were bumps in the roads as you guys were trying to get this done um, with your family? When you were thinking about where you wanted to take it, um, how you want to keep it in the family, like what were some of the areas that you feel like you want people to know um, to be careful when, when it comes to these things? And we can start with uh, Helen, and then we can go to Nancy, then the Michael, then the Baba Obi, then the Monisha. Okay. The first thing you have to decide exactly, say for instance, we are um, organic farmers and we grow a variety of vegetables. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, when people started inquiring about industrial hemp, uh, one of Joseph's brothers wanted to do that. And, um, so they talked about it, and they decided, Joseph decided he was using the farm, basically, but he turned over certain plots to him to grow the hemp. But what Joseph did, since we are certified organic growers, he does the same thing with his sister, who grows vegetables also. He prepares the land and everything. That way we don't have to put buffers in everything. Everything is now certified organic. But the basic thing to keep down arguments is to talk about it, reason together. And something I should have mentioned earlier that would be beneficiary to all of the participants here today. If you have a family member and they come up short, with paying the taxes. That tax has to be paid. Please come together and pay the taxes because that's why so many people lose their farms. One family member doesn't have the tax. Well, if I don't have it in my name, I'm not going to pay it. You have to kind of change that attitude and think about the big picture. So that's the main thing with us. They sit down and talk and reason together to keep that one thing don't sell and you do not want to lose the land. And you can ask me any questions you need to ask me if you have to. Thank you, Miss. This will uh, Nancy. Hi there. Um I'm trying to figure out, are we talking about the, the documents that you have in place or the challenges and barriers, which were? Yeah, let's, we, 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 we want to talk about like, what were some of the things that actually, as you were trying to think about the, the progression of it, what were those things that kind of came up that just, you know, were like you bump your head up against the wall type stuff? Oh, okay. Um, well, we, we actually, um, didn't have too many problems. Uh, part, part of the tribal land Harold put has a life estate and then named our son. And then the other part of the, um, tribal land, they have multiple names already on the possessory holding. And then the deeded part we actually put in a permanent easement with a land trust where we gave up the developmental rights. So um, it will always remain farmland. And we did that because of the prime soil and then also because of the location to it being the uh, joining uh, tribal land. So that was important for us. And uh, right now we're just trying to uh, see the benefits and possibly put it in a, a land trust. Uh, and that would be, you know, for, for the protection of it, 
the farm as a whole. Um, so we actually worked with Mainspring, which was a land trust and uh, gave up the developmental rights. Which okay, you can, if, if, you, if you look into a land trust, it can help you with um, tax benefits and uh, sometimes they will, they will purchase it. So then you will have money to work with. Um, you own the land. The only thing is that later on the heirs or if you were to sell the farm or anything, it can't be turned into a subdivision. You know, it, it's always gonna remain a farm forever. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Michael? Yeah, it's a lot of challenges that come with it. Um, I'd say the first thing is just how black people communicate in families. Many times we get together, usually at funerals, occasionally at weddings, and that's generally not the best time to have these conversations. Uh, and in light of COVID, you know, now social distancing with elders is a whole other thing, and there's technological challenges and communicating with elders about these things. Uh, so by the time you get ready to communicate with somebody, they're in the casket and you're trying to figure out what's next and sort through that. Um, the other challenge is really understanding the, helping everyone understand the value of land and land ownership. Uh, my great, great grandparents purchased our, our property in 1910 for $705. That land now is worth probably one and a half to $2 million. There's no other investment in the known universe that's going to give you that, that type of return um, ever. And land has done this continually and will continue to do this continually. Yet when we get the land, usually one person wants to sell it for something that's going to depreciate in about 10 minutes. A car, you know, a car or a car. Shoes. Um, and helping, I guess, the family to understand the value and history that it's one of the things that also spurred me to come back was air property that was sold. Uh, my great grandmother's land was sold. My grandmother's, where she grew up at, uh, just right down the street from my, our land while I was in Ghana. And the secrecy that comes behind it, no one knew it was being sold until it went on the block. The elders had discussed it, they talked about it, but it didn't include any of the younger people who had definitely paid the taxes and kept it in the family. Um, so sometimes it's how we communicate really limits us, especially as younger people trying to get into the conversation. You know, it's old folks conversation. We ain't quite earned enough birthdays to really be in that conversation. Yet, you know, their decision will affect us, you know, for generations to come. Uh, so being able to have a intelligent, respectful conversation on the legacy of that land and the value of that land, uh, where the elders can hear us and respect our voices. You know, I'm still Michael J. It, my uncle feels me as that little eight-year-old with his nose running. It's hard to see sometimes the youth as a young man that's trying to actually do something, especially if they don't see you have an interest in it. Um, and especially when those individuals as well may have left the land and have no intentions of ever returning back to the land. So that, you know, if, there been, if there's been any trauma on that land, many people want to just get rid of it. It's caused too much hurt and too much pain. Uh, so having open conversations about it is by far the best way to start it. Uh, if you're a younger person, communicate with those elders. Uh, if you're an elder, communicate with the younger people and let them know what you want them to do with the land. Um, go, it's a two-way street that requires a lot more communication than sometimes what we give it. We talk about a lot of other things, but we don't talk about this nearly as much. Thank you, man. Bob Obi. Oh, thank you. Can you hear me? Um, well, I, I mean, I agree with so much of what's been said already. Uh, in our experience, um, you know, trust and communication were the major issues. Um, yeah, people, you know, they grew up differently. They went off, they had affiliations that gave them ideas that um, really didn't value land, uh, you know, the farm life, the country life and all of that. And that's a like a social 
or at least it was uh, just kind of a, a social given. Um, so um, what, what we found was um, really helpful was, um, you know, to, it had the, 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 the project had to be led by somebody who enjoyed a certain amount of trust. And I was lucky in that regard. I'm, after my father was killed, I became the patriarch of our family uh, at a pretty young age. And uh, so uh, that gave me some status and um, past history gave me some credibility. Communication, we established a um, conference call line 12, 13, 14 years ago. And we've been talking once a month or so ever since not always in agreement, but we've always been open and conversing about a way forward and sort of a common goal. Uh, transparency is important. There's nothing that breeds suspicion and you know destroys trust as much as people feel like they something is being done without their knowledge, their approval. And uh, transparency is a big thing, especially where there's shared money and uh, benefit and so on like that is concerned. The story might not be a pleasant one, but if everybody knows it, it's not as damaging um, as it would be if it were a good story and it weren't being shared. That's important. Asking everybody to play a role, to take an active part in figuring out a pathway forward is critical. And people may not always know what to do, but they do know that they want to have a say in what is going on if they feel motivated to, to do that and to create the opportunity for that and a structure that guarantees that that will be allowed and that everybody's point of view, even though they might be different, will be valued equally in the consideration. So we set up a special thing in our group, I'll say this and I'll stop. But not everybody own had the same amount of interest in the ground that we own, but uh, we didn't set it up so that the person who owned the most had the loudest voice or the most say or the most votes. So what we installed purposely, it was, it was very, very specifically uh, something that we wanted to include was a supermajority, not of interest, uh, but a supermajority of of of, uh, of of votes. So most people have to agree on what it is that we do. Not everybody, because you know that creates one person shouldn't be able to stop the whole group from doing something that most of the group think is important. But everybody's vote counts the same for the folks who own the least for the folks who own the most. We set up the LLC because it was important for people to, at that stage, to maintain some level of ownership. And they didn't want to give that up. They did not want to give up the uh, opportunity to uh, you know, have their descendants own what they own. We may get to a place where that will change, but we honor what people felt passionate about in order to be able to come together to do something collectively. So as Mark could say about that, but those are the main points. Thank you. Thank you. Monisha, we, we're in our Q&A time, but I think it's super important for us to hear from you, especially as a black woman um, doing this type of work. Please, you know, what type of challenges and barriers have you ran into? Well, within the family, this is Uncle Al. He's the main supporter here. He sure. did join the, and this is my first cousin, Chris, if you'll slide over just a quick second. Oh, yes. So Chris and I are this generation and we're taking over from Uncle Al and Uncle Glenn. And right now what we're, we're trying to do is once we've heard from all of you all is that um, as they're trying to pass the torch and to preserve the land, not only are we looking at a uh, forecast for what to grow and what to do with the land, we're trying to do it in a respectful way that it honors not only their wishes, but their father's father's 
father's wishes, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, right now, it's a matter of we are going to have to sit down with Uncle Al and his brother Glenn, like Uncle Al is hands on. Uncle Glenn is, you know, uh, living in another part and he comes down and gathers everything and then, you know, skedaddles kind of thing. But uh, that's okay. We don't, that, that doesn't matter. That's what we do. We put up stuff for years and generations for our other family members. So we are right now trying to figure out how to honor the request of our great, our forefathers in keeping the land in the family and then getting everyone who's not say Al's direct descendant who has no interest in it or Glenn's direct descendant who doesn't have an interest in it, but his sister Mabel and his sister Wanda's children do and then getting their our first cousins, I would say their first cousins, speaking the third person here, getting our first cousins and their children interested in preserving the land. And we have a unique situation here in the kind of where we are all related. <laughs> all our families down here, all the African American families are related through marriage or through blood. And so all the black farmers own their lands down here. So a lot of it is sitting dormant. So it wouldn't be a problem for me to say, get all of our immediate family stuff together and also be touching on my great aunt's children's family and say, hey, this is how we're going to preserve this portion of your land. And Joe, this is how we're going to preserve yours so that all the black farmers in this area are still productive and their land is not just sitting there. And as Uncle Al's generation passes, it just ends up dormant or someone else buys it and we we lose it, you know, to uh, even some eminent domain as Mr. Obi was speaking on because we're very close to the North Myrtle Beach area. So in the coming years, that that growing beach is going to encroach upon their lands and we're trying to preserve it for food and for whatever they may want to do in the coming future. So those conversations are getting ready to be um, definitely going through these next few months. And I, as a woman, ah, you know how that goes amongst men. She's just a girl. Let her get two or three acres and see what she can do, that kind of thing. But um, right now, it doesn't matter who's on the line. The USDA and anyone, everybody needs everybody to get together and grow foods. You know, we need to grow foods and foods that will sustain our bodies and also sustain our families financially. So it's a matter of speaking about money. Somebody thinks that one person controlling all the land also controls all the money and they will get cut out of it. Um, I think I heard Mrs. Fields say something about paying the taxes for someone. So we're experiencing that now. It, 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 it does not matter to me that I or Chris or someone has to pay the taxes to keep the family land that's what we're going to do, you know, until we know what everybody can, or some key players, not everybody, um, the key players that are in control of it now, until they trust that we're, we're really looking at long term, because as of right now, God forbid, if Uncle Al or Uncle Glenn passes, the land is, well, who's going to own it? Where's it going to go? Who's going to take it? So that's what we're facing right now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, so we want to just kind of open this up, and we have a couple of questions already. Um, and so I'm probably not going to uh, call your name because I don't want to mess anyone's name up. But um, so our first question is how and where do you find what you can do with your land? And so um, Let's let Mavis kind of go on this one, and then anyone else that wants to chime in after that, we'll probably take one or two of you guys to answer that question. And I'm sorry, what's the question? I was looking at the chat, but I don't see the. <laughs> That's fine. It's it's up in the, it's it's been up for a while. So it's um how and where do you find what you can do with your land? Oh, okay. Um, so I don't have a background in agriculture, although I do work with the forestry organization. So I'm learning just like a lot of you are learning. However, um, both with my law practice and now with this program, I think a great place to start is with 
organizations who support landowners, particularly those who work with um, African American landowners or um, Native American landowners, because they're going to be great resources to help you connect with the other third parties that can be supportive if 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 the channels are navigated and you're dealing with people who are um, good people, so to speak. I think a lot of people could get shut down when they first go to the FSA office, for example, or or work with NRCS or even speak with the land trust. It could be um, it could be you know a, a intercultural difference, or it could just be that you know folks don't know. Um, what they're doing. So I think it's important to try to find organizations in your area that um, are supportive of landowners who are similar to, who have similar circumstances to you um, and who have values around keeping the land and keeping it in the family. Um, but yeah, there's lots of resources out there. I think it's also helpful to know what the ownership status is. Um, and if you know for a fact that you have heirs property, it could be very helpful. I think I said this earlier, it could be very helpful to know what the economic opportunities and conservation opportunities are in advance of pursuing addressing the legal issues because it could get really easy to get demotivated with the legal stuff. It's very complex. All families are dynamic and there's no, you know, one size fit all plan. Um, so yeah. This is and I always so recommend I would, as, mm -hmm. I would like to interject something with that if I can, please. Yes. Uh, NRCS was very helpful with us. Uh, we tapped into areas that we did not know that was available to us. Now, mm -hmm. I have a background in, I worked for an international shipping company for 29 and a half years. And no is not in my vocabulary. When I went down with my husband and I met, uh, I asked for the supervisor, okay? And I asked her to explain to me the different programs. She did that, okay? Also, I've worked with South Carolina State University. We worked with um, Clemson Extension, and I'm sure you may have some of these people in your area that can help you. And we also work with um, the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. These are different training areas that you can get involved with. You would be surprised how you would learn, and they could come to your farm and they can suggest many, many different things to you. That person can decide if it's feasible to them to try it or not to try it. Because a lot of times we miss out on things because we just don't know. Okay? But they have been very helpful to me. And with me, um, if you tell me no, make sure you tell the next person no also because it should be fair up and down the page. I just wanted to share that. Um, Jory, I put in the chat box two links um, to webinars that a forester, Sam Cook, and I have done on, on Ayers property. Um, so they're recorded, but you might find that they're helpful. Um, there's two, the part one, there's, there are two, and they, they kind of follow one another. So I would start with the first one. And I'd share, I mean, and just in growing, and this is somewhat uh, a generational thing. Um, if you're going for, growing for profit or for principle, and it's good to be able to find a balance between the two. Uh, I'm a vegan, uh, organic guy. Um, so I'm not going to use some of the same things, chemicals and other practices my uncle uses and has used. And you got to find a balance in terms of, you know, are you going to grow road crops for money? Are you going to do cattle? Are you going to do vegetables? And if so, what, what can you sell? Or do you want to do more heritage breeds and more other things? Because financially, you don't need the money. You just need to grow these things for principle, for heritage, for legacy. You have to decide where you are and what you're growing for. Uh, and if you meld all that together, that's great, um, of having production, principle, and also profit. Um, because for most of us, farming is also a business, and every business has to be profitable for it to be maintained. 
Um, and it's also one of those things that for the next generation, for them to make, see it viable, they have to see profitability. We all go to college or higher education to get a job to earn money. And if we can show that you can earn, like John Martin Fortier and some of these other YouTube guys, $100,000 on an acre of land, imagine how excited young people would get if you got 15 acres. That's 1.5 million that you say, if I work hard, I can do this. And that's the kind of incentive we have to have. So it's, as long as you have a market to grow, whatever you like, or a uh, financial cushion to grow, whatever you like, um, I, that's why I would encourage. Uh, find something that make, find both your profit, your principle, and your passion. That's great. And I want to remind all of the panelists, we can go ahead and unmute ourselves because we all open to answer these questions. We just won't speak over each other like what happened last night. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Baba Obi, you have something to say to that? I think what Michael said is exactly right. Um, I mean, so, you know, I came from a, um, you know, business career that was uh, lucrative and was interesting and so on, but it did not satisfy, uh, you know, my conscience. <laughs> and plus, you know, the land needed, you know, it needed a, a champion. And, uh, you know, my family did as well. So I don't know how much you would, what price you would put on that. To me, that's really valuable. It's the most valuable. So, you know, I, I've kind of lost uh, most of the allure for, you know, the money. Um, I think that thing's more important than that, but you do have to pay bills and, and uh, it does take some to sustain you, but you have to find that within your own spirit. It certainly is not all about that money, but it, um, you know, it, it's an it's important to find a balance, like he says. I think I think he said it perfectly. So, thank you. And that thing. Please. Oh, okay. Go go ahead, Michael. Um, there's a little crop that I refer to as the gateway plant to agriculture. That you all know as hemp. And if you're going to do that or look into that, I mean, ask permission, especially if you're on an air property, because you don't want to get any suspicious. Uh, but there's also, I'm sure, a lot of buzzing around recreational marijuana. And again, that's another crop that people are looking to get into uh, that brings younger people and older people kind of together. It's a crop that we all can appreciate and see the value of uh, and assist in maintaining the land and the legacy of the property. Uh, it can be very controversial, so I would definitely ask permission if you're not the 100% owner of that property. But it's one of those crops that you, sh you can consider uh, once you find a market. Ooh, Anisha, actually, I'm going to give you the next question because we're, we're getting close to our time and I'm going to wrap two questions into it. So someone asked, what advice would you give a, a new farmer? And then the next question after that was, do you need to have a full-time job to start a venture? Um, or if not, what advice would you give? So, or, or would you need to give full-time to start a venture? Well, I think that's kind of a duality in that, that question. But like, what, what would you tell to someone that's just starting out? Uh, the person that's just starting out, I would tell them, um, if you have access to land or if you have access to a half acre lot, or if you see an empty lot somewhere, maybe you're an urban farmer, um, go and talk to, find out, you know, who that land belongs to and then try your hand at saying, okay, let's, let's just call it a community garden first. If it's, if you're urban, uh, I, I've lived in D.C., I've lived in Philly, I've lived in Missouri, you know, all over, um, so to speak. And uh, gardening was something that was a part of me, even though I was like, I'll never farm, I'll never do this. You know, as a young kid, as soon as I got out and on my own and I was living everywhere else, I was always outside of those urban areas seeking somewhere to get my hands in the soil. So um, if you have family members and and, you know, there's a portion that you can start, start with one crop, tell them you want to grow melons or tell them you want to grow, you know, corn for the season. Start out with corn and uh, start out with something that maybe, you know, would, would be marketable. Someone, everyone loves homegrown tomatoes if they like tomatoes. I would say start with something like that. 
even if you're a um someone who's urban grow herbs for people and and start marketing your herbs you know to your friends or something um i'd say start small but you know start doing something grow potatoes whatever try it you know that kind of thing and what was that second question got it so i think yeah so i want to try to make sure I'm asking it correctly. They said, do you need to be full-time to start this venture? So I guess they're asking, do you need to put, do you need to be putting a full, putting this toward as if you're doing it like a full-time job or I'm yeah. assuming okay, um, as you start this out? Your whole heart into it. It's, it's not a novice, you know, it's not a notion is it, they say you could be a novice, but it's not a notion. I still work full time. I am working right now while I'm on this <laughs> webinar with you guys. Praise the Lord, you know, that kind of thing. And um, you, you're going to have to put your time in, but uh, you can do it like I do it. If, if you're used to doing it or if you've done it as a kid before, you get up early, you do your farm work, you work in the evenings, or if you're an evening, you know, a, a morning worker and you come home and do your stuff in the evening, then um, I don't think you have to be full time, but you have to be fully committed, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You don't have to quit your current job in order to do it, unless you're just like, you know, some of the panelists and myself, you really had an urge that just kept drawing you out there to get your hands and your feet in the soil. And that's where I am right now. And my cousin Chris, who's transitioning from Philly to come, you know, back home and, and, and work here. So Chris is into hydroponics and he has all that kind of stuff. So once we get all this together and in one central location, um, Rafi, actually, I didn't say this earlier, but they've helped us with our irrigation well. We had a a, um, a natural spring that runs through the properties that adjoins mine now and Uncle Al's and Uncle Glenn's over there. So it is uh, something that we, what you want to do is get together with someone who has a like interest and, and just get started. Jory, you found perfect. Oh, so sorry. No, you go ahead. All right, real quickly. One thing I think is valuable for people who want to begin, um, kind of clear about that, is to intern with someone who is doing it. Learn all you can from them. There's so many shortcuts and uh, mistakes that can be avoided and money that can be saved. And you'll get a real sense of whether or not you want to commit to a full-time thing or if you want to do a niche uh, effort or just what but it'll save you a lot to work with someone who's already doing it and uh, you'll you'll know by the end of a season whether this is something you really want to do or you know maybe some part of it but it'll save you so much in terms of mistakes and time and energy and maybe investment too so um, I, I really recommend that. Yeah, I'm gonna um, kick it to Taz right quick. He has some suggestions for us. Oh, I, well, I just wanted to, can y'all hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. So I just wanted to chime in. There was a question around, um, well, what do you do if you're coming from a, uh, you're not coming from a, uh, a heritage farm or your land access is an issue for you as a beginning farmer? And I think a trend that I've seen a lot of um, within uh, BIPOC and uh, communities of color lately has been um, farmers, smaller farmers pulling together to form uh, like land collectives and cooperatives, um, being able to pull together their buying power to look at um, creating a new legacy. And I mean, and that's not without lots of work and the same, the same issues around what are your values um, how are you communicating with each other um, and what your your structure looks like, whether it be an LLC or a trust or still things that will come up um, for those groups of farmers. But um, in terms of farmers getting into that, looking to access land and, and be close to viable markets, um, looking at ways to collectivize and to pull some of your buying power together um, maybe one strategy. And there's, there's a number of models out there, but just wanted to name that. Very good. Yeah. Um, anyone else want to speak to that who didn't get a chance? 
Well, hey, uh, Jory, I, I just wanted to say you at, they were asking about what to start growing. And if you're at the stage of being ready to grow, uh, I really want to also agree with Panisha. There's a real need for a higher quality food in, especially in communities of color, but, you know, in, you know, uh, working class communities everywhere and not always good access. And um, for me, it's about food. Uh, it's, uh, that's the reason that I wanted to get involved. It's still the reason that I want to get up and do it every day. So uh, that's what I would do. Yeah. Um, so I think Mavis, do you have any resources to share around the legal part with our farm, with our people who might be looking at how to engage with family members on heirs property or anything of that nature? Um, we kind of want to give a little bit of time to that and any places to point people to if they are in the middle of something like a, you know, tumultuous time dealing with this situation um so i uh again i put some links to some webinars that um i've done on airs property um it's not the same as having it live and um lakita and i have already talked about perhaps having a subsequent session um similar to what we did to at come to the table um to talk about estate planning and succession planning and dealing with airs property um but um I think it's helpful to have an asset map, you know, just like a visual inventory of the different resources that are available for you and your land in the area. And you can create um, categories. You can have like natural resource organizations, government organizations, civic organizations, law firms, your own companies, anything that, you know, could possibly be a resource for your land. Um, and I think that's helpful again, so that you're prepared and you have a place to go to, you know, a, a resource to look at to make those connections. But also I think it can help you feel motivated or maintain motivation when things are challenging. Um, you can go back and say, you know what, there are all these different resources out here for me. I'm not alone in this, um, et cetera. Um, and then I think also thinking creatively about financing legal resources uh, or, you know, legal help. Um, some organizations do provide um, um, funding to address the legal challenges. For example, the Sustainable Forestry and African American Land Retention Project, which I'm a part of. Um, each of these eight organizations in the eight states, um, they do provide resources around the educational part for, for, the, for um, the legal stuff, but also resources to help their landowners address the, the legal challenges. That's very geographic specific. So you'd have to find out if your, um, your land is in a county where an SFLR site um, is providing services. Um, yeah, I, I will admit that there are not a lot of lawyers who do this work um, from a perspective of keeping it in the family. So that is challenging. And so you may want to consider um, finding a lawyer who's in a more urban area who has legal experience related to real estate and estates, but also will work with you to keep it in the family. Um, and then you might also want to consider um, if there is conflict, whether you could use mediation as a way to or, um, address the conflict or use a third party to facilitate the conversation. Um, I know my triggers with each of my siblings. We still own this property together. And every year I have to inform them that the property taxes are due. And both of them work in technology and know how to look up <laughs> the county tax records, but they don't. Every year I have to tell them. And that's a sore spot for me, if, in case you can't see how my voice went up. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, having a third party neutral facilitate the conversation may allow each of you to just speak from your perspective and also help you listen to others um, and de-escalate some of the conflict um, so that you can move forward. Those are my thoughts. But hopefully we can have another webinar in the near future 
um, and ask yeah. answer more specific questions. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be awesome. I know that we do have some uh, people dropping on resources around like land loss prevention on the Center for Heirs Property, the Federation of Southern Cooperative and the Black Family Land Trust. Some of those those links will be dropped in the chat for those who might want to to do it. The, um, the Center for Heirs Properties in South Carolina um, and Black Family Land Trust is here in Durham. Um, and so the, the, the Federation of Southern Cooperative is is to the southeast, to my my uh, recollection, they they cover most of the southeast part of the country, and so does land loss prevention. So, um, yes, we please if any of you farmers have uh, this this or panelists, if you have a website that you want to to drop uh, in the chat, please put it there so people can go and look at what you have going on. Um, everyone, please pay attention to the resources to be in the chat. We have other uh, individuals uh, dropping things about podcasts and other things in there. Uh, we're coming in on the close of our time, but is there, um, I haven't seen any more questions directed toward uh, outside of resources that we're sharing right now. So, um, Yes. So, yeah. Are there any more questions, man? Before we close out, is there any any closing thoughts that anyone wants to leave us with um, around you know this topic of uh, land and, and heirs' property and you know sharing this with, with talking these conversations with your family? Jory, I'd like to add one last thing. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, this is Bernard. Um, if you're trying to bring your family together and say something as valuable as you know the land of your forefathers, leadership really matters. I was, uh, you know, I was in Mavis's position in the beginning, having to remind everybody about this and that. It was killed. We were forced to sell all the equipment and everything to settle his debts, and so we were able to keep the land and. And starting to replace that equipment and trying to get everybody to participate was not easy. But leadership matters, and good leadership is <laughs> that really matters. So you might have to put selfish, you know, the, the things that set you off, put that aside for the sake of the, the goal that you're trying to achieve. And it's really worth it. Um, so I just want to say that if you are going to be the leader, then, you know, be that and be a good one and your family will follow. You'll be able to accomplish so much. Thank you. Yeah, so one last question. Um, someone wants to know this, like, I guess the different ways you can lose your land. Um, and I guess if anybody wants to speak to that directly, um, please. I'll speak to that. So there's different ways. And I think our government and our laws play a huge part in that. So yeah, you can lose your land through tax foreclosure. Um, it varies state to state, but if you don't pay the property taxes, it gives the um, county a lien on the land and then they can take that lien and foreclose on it using the land as uh, you know the security um, and then you can also lose your land through the government when <laughs> through an actual taking so we heard about someone having I think Mr. Obi had eminent domain and that has happened that happens a lot I would argue more prevalently with um, communities of color where the government will determine that the land has to be used for um, whatever public good. Um, and then another way the government um, usurps people's land is that they'll lose records or records will not, <laughs> at least historically, I think this still happens in places though. Um, the records related to lands are um, banished <laughs> and, or they will um, draw map lines in a way that's not accurate and it truly reflects what happened to the land. Um, and then I've seen government actually just get land illegally and still be able to keep it, um, unfortunately, um, because so much time has passed and because our 
our justice system can be violent at times. And so that's how the government plays a role. And then um, when you have property with multiple owners, which is common among families, as we've heard, you know, ownership being passed from generation to generation, um, the way that they own the property is treated the same as any other multiple owner property. So if all of us on this call were not related, if we buy property together, it could make sense that if any one of us wants out of it, that we can go to court and the court just divide our share out and divide everybody else's share out. But when it comes to family land, that's really diminishing the legacy of the family land and the economic value of the family land. And as co-owners, we have the right to transfer our share to whoever we want, including third parties. So if you have a big farm next to a small family owned farm and the big farm wants that land, all they need to do is own a share in it. And then they have the legal right to seek partition, but most often they're seeking the for sale of it, which is the next level if it can't be physically divided. So I saw a case where there were over 72 family member owners and one person sold their share to the neighboring commercial farm. And then they successfully petitioned the court to force the sale of it because it couldn't be physically divided. So th those are a few ways. <laughs> and then there's adverse possession. Someone also talked about people moving away and not knowing that they have land. Um, you can, people can make claims on land and there's a, a, a period of time that has to pass and certain other things that have to happen, but they could eventually get ownership of it. That's a little bit more difficult than the other things that I described though. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Go ahead, Lakita. No, I was just going to say that it's right at four o'clock, like 3.59. So I wanted to, as we wrap up, um, make sure that you all feel like all hearts and minds are clear for now. If there are any burning questions or comments that you panelists feel like folks need to know and we can get that in 30 seconds or more, I want to give you that time now for that. All right, hearing nothing right now. I just want to thank you all um, for being on this call, all of you folks in the audience. I hope that you got something out of this discussion that um, will help you move forward as you deal with and start thinking about these things for your family or for your land, whether you already own or um, even a new landowner who are thinking about how can you set the trajectory on the right path um, for your generations to come. Um, I want to thank uh, Jory for moderating this discussion. Um, you did a fantastic job. Thank you so much. Um, most of all, I want to thank you panelists, you farmers, um, for sharing your stories. Um, for I just want to lift up that I understand that when you do share your stories, especially where there's been trauma and loss and conflict and all that. Those are sacred gems that you're allowing us to benefit from. Um, so thank you so much um, for your resilience, your determination, and just for your know-how having gone through this, um, for sharing it with us and sharing it with this audience. And thank you so much, Mavis Gregg, for lending your expertise, um, for sharing your family's history with this as well, um, for all of our benefit. Uh, that's all we have. I will let you know that we are saving the chat and we will be posting this discussion on Rafi's website um, probably in a few business days once we've had a chance to edit it. Um, we won't be editing content, just, you know, probably the earlier part where before you folks join the call so that you have a smooth, polished experience to enjoy. Um, and so we'll save all of these resources. I'm going to put my email information in the chat here for everyone um, so that if you have any questions, can't talk and type at the same time, feel free to reach out to me, Taz and Jory, if you I feel like if you can um, put yours there as well, or if I can't answer the questions folks have, you know, we're always in conversation. I can throw them over to you to get right back uh, to you. Uh, that said, We'll call this experience a wrap. Oh, there is one thing I almost forgot. 
I am going to put a link to a survey form. I would love to hear from you folks about what was helpful about this experience, um, any other um, offerings you would like for us to have for you going forward. Um, if you'll just answer, it's only three questions. It can be anonymous or not. Um, I will pop that in the chat now. If you will complete this survey. Ah, let me find it. There, there we are. Um, if you'll just take the time to do that before you go too far off into your day, like as soon as you log off this call, just stop for three minutes and complete that survey to let us know how this was for you. We'd appreciate that a whole lot. And uh, with that, I think a few of us can hang back if we want to, or staff and the rest of y'all, after you get that link, are free to sign off. Bye for now.